Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of boards, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the one-shot adventure Rescue a Familiar Tale, designed by Transparent Games, aka Anna Konzak, Andrew Bashinsky, Matthew Booth, and Bernardo Bueno from Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This review has been sponsored by the publisher, and a review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Now, most of us have grown up with uh, usually animated tales of anthropomorphic uh, animals and creatures saving the day, being the heroes. And of course, we have animal companions and familiars in D&D, but rarely do they actually get a chance to shine and be the stars. In Rescue a Familiar Tale, that's the whole point. It's a one-shot where players get to embody... Uh, specific animals that are usually found as ranger and druid animal companions or uh, wizard familiars, and they get to save the day. Their masters, the adventuring party, has been um, captured by an enemy, and they have to set off on an adventure. Now, this is a one-shot. It's a pretty small, uh, it's basically like a one-dungeon thing, pretty much designed as a one-shot because the adventurers are all pre-designed, and it doesn't matter like what level, and in fact, the level doesn't play into it at all because we're not playing as those adventurers we're playing as the actual animals and they are literally the animals like they are the little familiars and beasts most of them have like one hit point and like an ac of 10 and no real ability so how the hell do you play creatures like that well the answer is it's a it's a stealth uh, rescue mission basically you can't really fight much although it does have a nice little twist towards the end where you are given empowered abilities that basically turn your animals into low-level adventurers so you can actually get a little combat in there so I think it does actually hit most of the pillars of D&D &D, although there's not a whole lot of socialization you can do because again you're animals you can't actually speak now because you are animal companions and familiars of seasoned adventurers you're not just a random animal. You are actually trained, you have skills, you've seen, you know, you, you've probably been given tasks to like pick locks and that kind of thing and, and do recon and scouting. So you're basically highly trained animals. So I think it's a really fun twist. It's a really clever idea for a one shot is to be able to play as the creatures. I think that's absolutely awesome. And it, it goes really far into it by uh, designing by balancing it out so that you're not just a party of like bears or you're all not just like hawks or something. Instead, each of you is supposed to play as a certain uh, animal class, I guess to use a term. Um, so the adventuring party that you are the animals of consists of a ranger, druid, warlock, and wizard, all of whom can have pets or familiars. So one player should be the ranger's companion, in which case you are playing a um, like a, a, a battle-capable beast who has, you know, actual hit points and a proper stat block you could actually battle. And that includes, like, a panther, a wolf, or even a velociraptor, something that's powerful. Um, you can also play as a flying creature, which is the warlock's familiar, a, a aquatic creature, as the wizard's familiar, and the druid's familiar is, like, a stealthy, tiny beast, like a spider or a lizard or a rat or something. So you've got a automatically balanced party of different skill sets and uses in the adventure, and I think once you get to the cave, it does a pretty good job of giving opportunities for each of these animals to be able to shine with the notable exception that the, the big beast probably isn't going to come into play until actual combat occurs but at least they can be somewhat useful until they actually gain those empowered abilities the actual you know i, I love the opening twist and, and the and the the part where in fact i would even surprise them as be like hey here's a you know i'm going to give you pre-designed characters and the twist is like oh but those characters are actually captured they're ambushed by a mind flayer they all get uh, loaded into a cart, which I, I love the visual of a, of a Mind Flayer, which, you know, I guess thumbs up for using a Mind Flayer. They're really cool enemies. But on the other hand, the Mind Flayer just hangs out in a cave and captures local people and just kind of drains them and then has a bunch of, like, Grimlock, uh, uh, I was going to say assistants, that's probably not the right word, but, you know, like, minions, I guess. Uh, and, and they just throw, like, the adventurers that, he, that he's stunned in the back of a cart and just I'm picturing this Mind Flayer walking along with this cart full of adventurers just going off to the cave. That's a silly visual, but the whole thing is kind of a, a goofy concept, and I appreciate that it kind of goes there. Um, but there's a, a fun, you know, opening uh, moment where your adventurers are captured, leaving behind the 
animals in different states. So like the, I don't know, the hawk was out hunting something. And for some reason, the ranger's pet is in a cage. Like he got in trouble. And it does a fun thing where it's like, you know, describe what your companion looks like and why, you know, what were they doing uh, of what they were doing when the adventurers got captured. You know, it really kind of tries to drag the players into the game and make them active participants, which is always fun to see. Um, but the actual opening event, I thought, was a little too railroady and not super compelling after that. So it's divided up into five parts, but it's basically just part one is the opening of what I just described, the adventures being captured, and then you left behind, and then there's the cave where you have to go rescue them. In between his three parts, part two is trying to free the ranger companion from a cage, which... What I would have liked to see is different methods for doing that. That's a way for the, you know, the players to start familiarizing themselves with their animals and have fun with it. I mean, it's going to be, if it's anything like my table, everybody's going to be having fun and laughing about it and, and goofing off about what their animals can do and all this. And I would just let them have fun with it. But the way it's written is it's supposed to kind of railroad the players into making sure each animal uses their specific ability. So it mentions the fact that you don't have the key a twig or branch isn't going to work. Instead, what's supposed to happen is the flying animal is supposed to spot like a wire in the water and then the, you know, swimming animal can go get it. And it's supposed to have all this teamwork and stuff go together, which that's fine if it works, but I would have preferred more options in case you don't want to railroad the players into one specific like items. It's almost like an adventure game at that point. There's like one item in this one area that you need to get to open the thing. Um, but and, and it, it needs to be more open-ended and, and probably allow, like, I mean, what if the players would have just goof around and be like, well, let's somebody should grab the bird's beak and try to use that as a lockpick or something, you know, because I could definitely see that happening, and I would probably just allow that to happen because it's it's just kind of a part of the goofiness. Um, and then part three is you're just meeting this old uh, kindly ranger in the area, and it's just a social scene, although I would play up the like, role-playing goofiness because all the players are animals and can't speak with the ranger, but the ranger can kind of, you know, tell the animals, and they can, you know, look. he can look at the tracks and basically say, hey, the point of that scene is to tell the players outright in case they don't quite understand. And the opening description does mention like a blue figure with tentacles for face, but in case your players aren't familiar with the mind flare, the ranger can say, Hey, you should not. What's weird is that one NPC interaction, which again, you can't really socialize with is basically telling you not to do the adventure. Um, but what it's really doing is warning the players, Hey, you can't actually fight this mind. Even the adventurers would be hard pressed to fight a mind flare, let alone these one hit point animals for the most part. So that's kind of a, a weird scene, but it's supposed to warn the players in terms of the danger, which means once we actually get to the uh, adventure, this is a stealth reconnaissance adventure, which is exactly how it should be designed because that plays to the strengths of all these tiny ass animals for the most part. Uh, I love that there's a stream that goes through the cave because then the aquatic animal has its uses. Um, obviously, the stealthy and the bird can all get in there and, and see what's going on. They can find the adventurers all captured in the cells. They can see that there's a bunch of Grimlock guards. Um, the one thing that I find really lacking here, first of all, I love having a full-color battle map. That's amazing. In fact, this product goes above and beyond in terms of what it gives virtual tabletops. We have all tokens for all those animals I mentioned. There's over 20 of them, each of which, by the way, has a character sheet that I'll show you in a bit um, with full tables for different quirks and traits and things, which is awesome pictures. Uh, and then we get tokens that you can easily just drop this into. And this is given as a gridded and non-gridded version. Although the gridded version is weird because it, I don't know if it's scaled properly. Like this, what looks like a giant bed here is like one five foot square in the grid version. So I'm not sure if it's supposed to be five foot squares or 10 foot squares. Um, but I think it's a pretty well-designed dungeon. The problem is there isn't enough information on, like, guard patrols or the activities that are going on in here. It's all kind of vague. It mentions that the Mind Flayer uh, doesn't really sleep. Instead, he kind of sleeps in, like, intervals. And then the Grimlocks, uh, which are little, like, I don't know, troglodyte-type creatures that are blind and, and seem pretty well-balanced for an adventure like this where you're a bunch of animals... Um, they usually sleep in shifts, and there's supposed to be as many of those as there are adventurers, so half of them are awake and half of them are asleep, but, like, what are the awake ones doing? There's not enough information in, in terms of, like, where they're going, and what I really like to see in all stealth missions is firm details on the enemy, because something that players like to do is, you know, obviously you want to scout, you want to plan, that's part of the whole, you know, stealth heist thing, and you want to be able to look and see what the enemies are doing. So I think, importantly, the DM needs to have information on 
where the enemies are going. Do they have a regular patrol? Uh, you know, what can the players learn just by observing? And there needs to be more concrete information about that. And I would also throw in scripted events so that, you know, maybe one of the villagers is dragged out. It's, it says there's adventures are captured. And there's also some local villagers that are captured in there. You could use one of those as a red shirt and just drag them out of the cell. His Maybe his brain's already been fried by the Mind Flayer, and, and then the Grimlock eats the uh, body. Which, man, what a great relationship. Like, the Mind Flayer eats the brain, Grimlock eats the body. Uh, perfect partnership right there. Um, so you could have that be an event, for example. You could have them, like, eat it, and maybe a couple of the Grimlocks are distracted, and maybe one of them is looking, you know, and just the animal companions can react and, and do these, uh, you know, whenever they want to do their ambush thing at certain times is what I would have liked to see is more information about what the guards are doing. You can see there's kind of a interesting, like, use of the map art here to denote, like, maybe the path that the enemies go on, which is a good start, but I would have liked to see that in the text for sure. Um, and then whenever the animals are able to find the uh, adventurers, the wizard, who is still lucid because they've all been knocked out by the Mind Flayer, can then empower the animal companions and give them new abilities and essentially make them adventurers, which is a total bullshit DM ability. Like, I don't know what player characters would be able to, you know, because they're just adventurers, would be able to do that, but I'm fine with it because it's just a fun little one-shot. Um, and these empowerments are actually listed as handouts uh, at the end, and each animal actually has its own specific abilities that it gains, as well as gaining, like saving throws and proficiency bonuses and hit points to basically make them a combatant. So that solves the issue of like, well, the only one character of this group can actually like battle the Grimlock because one of the Grimlocks has the key. So you're going to need to either steal it from them or battle them. And it, it definitely seems like it wants to actually have you fight, but it wants you to do it in a smart way so that you don't wake up the mind flare because it's basically game over. If you wake up the mind flare or, you know, in any way, like aggro that boss, so you're not supposed to fight the boss, you're supposed to just fight the minions, which also there's no notes on stealing the key if you want to just be real stealthy about it, which I would also encourage because that could be really interesting. Um, but you're giving this empowerment, which should um, motivate the players to be able to fight because before then they probably would not. And I mean, they even gain like minor spell casting abilities and all these things. I want to highlight the best one of all, which hopefully somebody takes the seahorse, the seahorse, which is an aquatic animal. Um, gains the ability of Illusory Jouster. The seahorse's illusionist master is enchanted to have an illusory rider that can make attacks on its behalf. As a bonus action, the seahorse causes a tiny triton jouster to appear on its back. While the illusory jouster ability is active, the seahorse can use its action to charge at a hostile creature within five feet. That's awesome. That is fantastic. Hopefully somebody picks the seahorse. Um, all these abilities are really, really fun. They play up you know, things that the uh, creatures can do and the fact that there are different classes. So you've got, you know, there's a couple spell, the, the familiars are more spell casty while the, uh, the, you know, the other ones, like the rangers, going to be more of a, a powerhouse in battle. So that's a really, really fun idea and encourages the players to be able to fight while still, you know, you still have to definitely tell them, well, hopefully they know, you cannot wake up this mind flare. Look at these character sheets, though. These are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we're given uh, really, really nice art, which it's very, you know, well designed throughout, very lovely artwork I enjoy. And then multiple tables for each animal, including like colors, traits, um, quirks. Um, the master actually has, you know, maybe a kind of unique relationship you have with your master in terms of different kind of quirks that they've given you or, or you them or something. So it's, it's, it, it really goes above and beyond what this is in terms of giving you all these extra features. And like I said, the tokens are there, all those empowerments or actual handouts, all that is a lot of fun. Um, the actual ending, you know, basically is solved once you free the adventurers. So it doesn't have a typical big boss fight. Instead, it's kind of a cut scene where the adventurers deal with the mind flare at the end and you basically won. But there is an option, or you just escape basically to, you know, fight another day. Um, there is an there are optional epilogues you can do, which you can essentially kill off those adventurers and continue a campaign with your animal with your uh, awakened animals. And then there are entire uh, rules for uh, essentially empowering your animals and giving them, basically turning them into adventurers, so you can play like a. I don't know, a, a true, like, Disney-esque campaign with these little animal creatures, which, I mean, that's a, I can't imagine that would be too sustainable for a normal-sized campaign, maybe for a few fun adventures, but, you know, who knows, maybe somebody would be into that. Um, 
but I love that that option is given there. That's a lot of fun. Uh, the other epilogue is you can choose to uh, continue on as those adventures if you wanted to also. if you wanted to. Essentially, there are two big block texts here for the epilogue, but one of them is basically the animal, uh, the adventurers defeat the uh, Mind Flayer in a cutscene, and the other one is they die to the Mind Flayer in a cutscene. But I think they still kill it, but they all end up dying. So it just depends on if you want to play as them or as new adventurers, you know, or whatever options you want are there. But just the fact that it goes so hard with the playing as animals and gives you all these extra benefits is what I really, really love to see and I think is the, the strong suit of this adventure. So let's go over my pros and cons for Rescue a Familiar Tale. Pros, a stealthy rescue mission that plays into each animal's strengths. I think that is the exact way to design a mini adventure where you are playing a bunch of animals which is you know what you use these animals for which is primarily scouting and reconnaissance and that's a lot of what this dungeon is it's, it's still very small and, and pretty simple but you know it it plays the strengths of all these different animals where they can look around and, and note things uh, pro over 20 animal character sheets and vtt friendly tokens plus battle map grid and gridless the uh, basically all the additional stuff to this adventure is more than i see most like bigger adventures do so i always appreciate that uh, pro optional epilogues to continue the adventure as awakened animal adventurers with buffed up stats that's a really fun bonus although i would probably just run it as a one shot but i like that the option is there and pros i literally just wrote in all caps illusory seahorse jouster but essentially all the empowered abilities is really fun and i think that's a good idea of Basically, you get the best of both worlds. So the first half of the adventure, you're still your little tiny animals, and you're scouting, and you're worried, and all that. And then for the climax, you become empowered, and you can actually fight at least the minions. So it kind of balances it as you become like a level one adventure. And I think that's a really good balance. And those empowered abilities are really fun. And it's another twist, you know, on top of what you thought you were just going to be this little tiny crap animal with no real stats and not be able to fight. And that's a good twist at the end. It's like, oh, no, you can actually fight, but just don't fight the Mind Flayer. <laughs> Cons, uh, the opening events, uh, you know, as I mentioned, getting the ranger out of the, getting the ranger's pet out of the cage and talking to the, um, the old random ranger in the forest aren't terribly compelling. They're not really that interesting compared to the actual uh, cave itself. And I think it, it could have been a little bit more done there to give the player some more options and agency. And the other con is I feel like it was really lacking on guard patrols and making the dungeon more of an active setting, which you really need to do even more than most dungeons if you're planning on having it be a heist or stealth or whatever mission that's not just a room-to-room -room battle. Uh, you need to have that dungeon have active things going on that players can observe and thus you know, gain that information and learn and plan their own attacks. And that's what makes you know, stealth heist missions so much fun and, and, and interesting. Final verdict, the simple yet well-designed stealth rescue mission shines a fun spotlight on D&D's animal companions. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. And you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.